Good morning, church. It's good to be worshiping with you again this morning. Uh, boy, I look forward to the day that we can all be together. But for now, at least we're blessed to, in knowing that we're able to worship together for the time being in this virtual way. I do have a few announcements, but before that, it's really important that you stay connected. Check your email often. Get on our email update distribution list if you're not on that by sending an email to fenter.jason at yahoo.com. And Jason Fenter will get you lined up again, fenter.jason at yahoo.com. The elders are good to send uh, prayer requests and, and announcements from time to time. So we encourage you to check that email and stay connected. Just a few uh, people we want to remember to be praying for. Roy Roberts, of course, uh, Pauline Durbin, Effie Ortega. Uh, we want to remember Virgil Burge as well. And Jenny Gels has requested prayers for her sister, sister Nancy. I know others have, have likely requested prayers, and so we want to remember them also. Um, an announcement, uh, there is a drive-by baby shower this afternoon for Lauren Crum and her baby Gavin on uh, this afternoon. So that's from 2 to 3.30 at the Circle Drive of the Parks Home, 810 Avenue Q. Diapers and wipes, what they're requesting in exchange for a sweet snack. So we encourage you to, to drive by, leave a gift, and, and let's enjoy uh, fellowship that way. Also, we are going to be blessed this morning by hearing from one of our new missionaries that we supported, Bert Ritchie. Bert and Doreen uh, live in Coleraine, Northern Ireland, and he spent his uh, working career as an adult being a missionary there in Coleraine. He has a tremendous uh, uh, ministry going on there. Uh, I first became acquainted with Bert uh, in 2003 when the LCU choir went over for some outreach choir concerts, and Bert was just tireless in organizing those. We made a return trip just last May, May 2019, and Bert and Doreen were such gracious hosts. Uh, Bert had a deep impact on my students. As we could tell, he is just doing much to, to reach out in the community. And so we look forward to hearing from Bert. And I want to introduce you formally to Bert Ritchie as you uh, hear from him this morning. We hope that maybe one day he'll be able to visit us in person. Before we begin our worship, let's uh, start in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you that we can worship you in this way. We lift up those who are ill, those that we're mindful of, that, that we've mentioned, and all the others that are close to us. Father, we pray that you bless us during this time of, of infection, that the virus would, would, be, would go away very quickly, that you would bless our healthcare workers, all those first responders, and all of us, that we would stay healthy. More than that, we would stay connected with you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for having us no matter what. No matter what happens, we know that you are in control, and we thank you for that. Thank you for loving us through Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's begin our time of worship with a reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. He will also keep you firm to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our places of worship, the walls of which, like many throughout the world at the moment, lay silent. Walls that resonated with the laughter of fellowship, the songs of praise, the mourning of our dead, and I lie eerily silent. But there's something about silence and solitude that's almost contradictory to God's creative plan. Uh, his prime creation was not meant to be alone, and so God created for him a help meet. But there are times in life in which, either by choice or by circumstance, we are forced into moments of silence and solitude. And one of the things that comes to mind with me is the Old Testament Babylonian captivity where that psalmist recorded as they sat by the babbling brooks of Babylon they wept when they remembered Zion and indeed there are times like this in which the solitude forces us to to contemplate and reflect over the things that are important in life and whatever those things may be whether they be our spiritual relationship with God 
whether it be our human relationship with one another, the thing that, that binds them together, makes them sacred, is a word that's frequently used in the Old and the New Testament, and that is the word covenant. It's a trust and understanding, a commitment, a sacred commitment between two. God made a promise to Abraham in which through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And as we come to the scripture of Matthew chapter 26, and that very solemn moment when Christ broke the news to the disciples that this would be the last supper. A difficult moment, a challenging moment, and as they passed the cup one to the other, he reminded them that this is the covenant of my blood that is shed for you. So probably climaxing at a time unlike any other, the concept of covenant was driven home by Jesus. An expression of the relationship, binding spiritual relationship we have with God our Father. And such we are doing today is an honoring of his request to us that we take the bread and the wine which is symbolic to us of the covenant of Jesus Christ. And as we do so, it's also a moment not only of reflection, but a moment in which we recommit ourselves to that covenant. It's true in the daily struggles of life that the importance of relationship with God and with other seems to diminish to the realm of unimportance. So maybe if any good comes out of this situation we're in at the moment, this forced solitude, maybe it will be an opportunity for, for you and for myself uh, to look at those covenants, beginning with our covenant with God, but also our covenant to one another. At times are you those promises of love, fellowship, justice, and mercy, all the things to which God held in very high esteem. And I want to join with you this morning as we celebrate our communion with Christ. I thank you for the partnership that we have had in the sharing of the gospel. And I pray that God will richly bless you as we join with him in this communion. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the sacrifice your son made and what this bread represents is his body dying on the cross for us. And we're so grateful that we're able to come together as a body, even from afar during this strange time and share in, in this communion with you. It's in Jesus name we pray. Amen. God of grace and mercy, God of love, as we continue our communion with you, help us to consider the cross and the sacrifice that allows this interaction with you. Father, so many don't understand the cross and certainly not the sacrifice, but maybe it's best explained by two simple words, matchless love. Thank you for that love and for your choice of us as your children, and we are so undeserving. Help us, Father, to reflect on the power in that blood that was shed for us and reflect on that power daily, not just at this time. May we partake of this emblem in a way that pleases you 
And may we always be willing to glorify Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. This is uh, week number six of our virtual worships, and glad to have you with us this morning. The title of this morning's lesson is The Body, and I'll tell you that a couple things happened this past week that led me toward this uh, lesson. The first thing is that, uh, as you know, I'm a big sports fan, and I generally have spent a couple hours every week uh, for years uh, watching sports on uh, television or going to games and those kinds of things. And there just isn't any on TV, hardly at all. Uh, I've watched a few of the old replays, but I'm not much into old replays. But I did catch a new documentary concerning uh, Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls. I, I watched the first uh, uh, of that series. And in that series, it uh, really focuses on Michael Jordan as a uh, young college player back at the University of North Carolina. That's where he first came to my attention. And watching some of the uh, uh, clips of Michael Jordan as a young man uh, playing basketball, it's just amazing at how, what he was able to do. Uh, this uh, uh, extreme athleticism, the hand-eye coordination, the strength, the agility, the flexibility, uh, the ability to jump uh, so much that uh, almost looked like he was levitating compared to those he was on the court with, and those were excellent athletes in their own right. And so it was really amazing watching that uh, uh, young Michael Jordan and his uh, um, amazing physical body. And then I was reading a list of uh, movies. Theaters are closed right now, and I ran across a list of those movies that have been recently released or were being held for release uh, during this uh, coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic. And uh, as I was reading down that list to kind of see what might be coming uh, out a little later on this year as the uh, uh, theaters are safe to go to again, and I ran across one called Mini Mata, and uh, it caught my eye. It stars Johnny Depp. And that's a picture of Johnny Depp in uh, uh, this particular movie. And it doesn't look anything like Captain Jack Sparrow. Uh, but they did a really good job because this is based on a true story. And he is playing the role of Eugene Smith. Eugene Smith was a very well-known, uh, uh, highly honored war photographer and a photographer for Life magazine when it was in its heyday back in the 60s. So Eugene Smith uh, and the story he brought to the world's attention are the subject of this particular uh, movie. Now, I'm not going to recommend uh, Mini Mata the movie. Uh, the reason is, is I pulled up a trailer for Mini Mata, and in that short uh, trailer on YouTube, there were enough uh, uh, four-letter words to curl my hair, so um, I don't recommend it. But the reason it caught my attention is because years ago, I don't know how many years ago, I saw a documentary on Minimata. It was a 1971 documentary by uh, Noriaki Tushimato, and he used a lot of those uh, photographs that Eugene Smith had taken. And even though I don't know exactly when I saw it, sometime after 1971, still after all those decades, some of those images from that particular documentary um, are still in my mind uh, and come easily to mind. Minimata is a small fishing village in the southwest part of Japan. And what happened was they started having fish kills. Well, if you're around the ocean, fish kills come every once in a while. Maybe red bloom, algae, algae or something along that line. Uh, maybe just a change in temperature or uh, something else gets in the water, depletes the oxygen and there's a fish kill. So that's not uh, really all that uh, out of the ordinary. And then seabirds started dying. Again, that's not a great deal of, uh, uh, of a rare event. Uh, it does happen every once in a while. But then what happened was they started seeing the cats dying. 
and the cats would die in a strange way. They would do a dance where they would uh, hump up in the middle and then very stiff-leggedly would dance around and dance around and dance around and finally just die. And this caused the scientists to, scientists to uh, uh, start trying to investigate what was going on in uh, Minimata. And here's uh, uh, Minimata. Uh, what they found was there was a uh, factory called the Chiso factory that was located just a few miles above the uh, uh, bay uh, where Minimata was located. And this factory started out as a fertilizer factory back in the late 1800s, but it had um, broadened its uh, products until it uh, was making quite a few different things. And they were pumping their wastewater into the ocean. And what the scientists found was that that uh, wastewater contained mercury, specifically methylmercury. And that methylmercury would get into the plankton, the plankton would be eaten by the small fish, and the small fish would be eaten by the big fish. And then, of course, the big fish would die and be on the shore and be eaten by the birds, and the birds would get sick and die. And then the cats would eat the fish and die. That would be bad enough if that was the whole story, but that is not the whole story because it was too late by the time they found this out to save the children. And the children and the images that Eugene Smith took back in the uh, 60s concerning those children still haunt me to this day. Those pictures of mamas holding their children, their children are, are rigid, unable to move at all, and their faces are in what's called a rictus, um, that's sort of a permanent grin, uh, unable to control any part of their body. So the contrast between those bodies and the body of Michael Jordan kind of hit me hard. At Minimata, there were 1,600 dead, mostly children, thousands more who had catastrophic mental and physical uh, maladies because of, of the mercury in the water. And it's called, still today, uh, heavy mercury poisoning is called Minimata disease or Minimata or Chiso Minimata syndrome. So it's one of those things that uh, was horrible and uh, mercury poisoning is always a, a horrible thing. There are many metaphors for the church and the Bible. And here's some that came to my mind. Kingdom, which of course is one of the most common ones. Priesthood, family, house, nation, a marriage, a flock, exiles in a foreign country. And then there's the body. Used as a metaphor several times, uh, probably the longest essay concerning it, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 27. And we'll read that in a few moments. And if you have your Bible, uh, you might want to turn there as we will make quite a few references to that particular passage. Let's talk about the context a little bit. Corinth was uh, a city on the, uh, uh, what we call Greece today, uh, sort of halfway down the Grecian Peninsula, right on an isthmus between the northern part and the southern part of uh, of uh, uh, the Greek Peninsula. And it was a major travel and trade crossroads. Being there on that uh, isthmus, it was a uh, place where that uh, ships came in on each side and where the land traveled north and south. So it was a, a crossroads. That's uh, the best way to describe it. And it was one tough mission field. You can't imagine a much worse or much uh, harder mission field than Corinth during that uh, first century. Had numerous temples. It was a, uh, a paganistic culture with uh, uh, all kinds of different temples. The largest temple was the temple to Aphrodite. Aphrodite was the goddess of fertility and many, many worshipers of, uh, uh, of Aphrodite were present there in Corinth. And um, that's part of the worship of Aphrodite involved temple prostitution. So you can see what a tough, tough place it would have been. Fact is, it was so bad and so sexually immoral in Corinth that the word Corinthianize was used in that time in that uh, Middle Eastern culture and Mediterranean culture as a euphemism for sexual immorality. So if you said someone was Corinthianized, it meant that they had been fornicating, they'd been involved in sexual immorality. So a very, very tough mission field. The Church of Corinth. We read about the church in Corinth in that long letter uh, of 1 Corinthians, and maybe the first word that comes to mind when you think about Corinth is it was a fractured church. They were divided 
in, in all kinds of different ways. They were divided along racial and uh, ethnic grounds. Um, that was a big problem. Uh, religious background, those who are of Jewish background versus those who were of a pagan background, tremendous uh, challenges to uh, bring those two groups together and keep those two groups together. Uh, they had a bad case of preacheritis. In the first two or three chapters, uh, Paul addresses that preacheritis, or what we would call preacheritis. Some were um, had been baptized by Paul, some by Apollos, some by Peter, some by others, and and they built their own little cliques about around who had uh, converted them, and so they were divided along those lines. They were divided along wealth and social status lines. Uh, fact is, in 1 Corinthians, uh, it was so bad that uh, as they were having their uh, meals, their love feasts together, those who had plenty to eat would uh, stuff themselves and leave nothing for the poor that were part of the same group. So they were fractured along social status lines as well. And then they were Frac uh, they were uh, fractured across the lines of uh, the type of miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. In that uh, first century with laying on the apostles' hands, there were various kinds of miraculous gifts that are talked about in uh, those chapters through there. Uh, we won't go into that in detail at this point in time, but th these miraculous gifts uh, were of different uh, levels, you might say. And so they were divided along those lines as well. So that's the context in which Paul writes this chapter 12 of first corinthians and i want to just go ahead and read those verses beginning in chapter 12 verse 12 down through verse 27. it's a little bit of a long reading but i think uh, uh, i think it's important for you to get a feel for how strongly paul makes the uh, metaphor of uh, the body as the church come alive for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body though many are one body so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all are made to drink one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would, be, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think are less honorable, we, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, given greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, and that the members have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. The metaphor of church as the body. Let's draw just a few lessons from that to remind ourselves what that entails. Number one, every member is critically important. Every member critically important. All the members of the body, though many, are one body. Verse 12. Whether it's a Paul or a James, Paul was uh, had mission fever. He had a hard time staying in any place. He was continually going from one town to another, establishing churches or checking on churches or visiting uh, various people, uh, constantly on the move. James, on the other hand, tradition tells us, stayed in Jerusalem virtually the entire time that he was alive. And James was known as the uh, man with camel's knees because he was uh, on his knees so much praying uh, for the saints. So Paul or James, whether you're a traveler or whether you're a stay-at-home person, either one of them, both of them, every one of them is critically important. Whether it's an Apollos or a Dorcas, Apollos was an orator, a preacher. Dorcas served quietly, making clothes uh, for those who were needy. So huge difference between the, the characteristics of those people, but 
still everyone critically important. And, and maybe the philanthropist who can um, give large amounts of money or the widow with her, as the King James says, might, uh, the widow with her penny, doesn't make any difference. Every member is critically important. Secondly, every member can serve. Every member can serve. Hand or foot or eye or ear, presentable or unpresentable, doesn't make any difference. Every member can serve and should serve. Different circumstances create opportunities for different talents. And I'm reminded of this during this particular time. We have those things like the front porch ministry going on. We have those things, those who are making masks uh, uh, for those who are on the front lines. Those who are simply being encouragers for others. Uh, different circumstances create those opportunities for the different uh, talents that we have within the, uh, uh, the flock. So every member can serve. I'm reminded of Esther chapter 4 and verse 13. You remember that Esther is reluctant to go into where the king is and Mordecai tells her, maybe it was for such a time as this that God put you here. Maybe during this coronavirus pandemic, while we're uh, separated from each other physically, together spiritually, together virtually through the um, technology that uh, we have available, still there are opportunities and every member can serve. Maybe it's for such a time as this that God has put you here. Thirdly, every member needs connection. Every member is connected to every other member. As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. I'll think of uh, the next letter, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. In chapter 11, uh, Paul is making a defense of his apostleship. Some false teachers have arrived in Corinth and they've uh, spread the, uh, uh, the rumor or they've been teaching actively that uh, Paul really wasn't an apostle. Uh, and so he's having to defend his apostleship in that chapter. And he talks about his dedication, his mission, his missionary efforts, his missionary trips. He talks about the successes that he had establishing congregations all over the known world of that day. And he did that despite persecution. And he lays out all of those horrible things he went through as part of his persecution. And you would think that with that, uh, uh, that, that history that Paul had, that he would be a big picture person, that he would be focused on the big picture, that he would be thinking about, oh, well, we have uh, uh, 16 congregations in uh, uh, Asia Minor and we have uh, 12 congregations over in, uh, uh, in, in what we call now Italy or the Rome area. Uh, we have 15 over in uh, Greece. No, he's not talking about those things at all. As you get the end of this particular uh, essay in, in chapter 11 of uh, 2 Corinthians, he says this, And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. And we think of churches, you think, well, he's talking about these different congregations and how the statistics are going here and there. No, look at that next verse. Who? What individual, in other words, is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to fall, and I am not indignant? Those who were in each of the congregations scattered wherever they might be, he had the concern for each individual purpose, person. He wanted them to be connected to the church and connected to each other. Fourthly, every member needs compassion. The idea that always comes to me when I think of every member cooperating in compassion is this, but that the members have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. It's easy to focus in on that idea of suffering together. You think of someone who has hit their thumb with a hammer. It is not a carefully thought out reaction. It's not like you, I'm going to open my mouth and scream or feet. You need to dance around a little bit or left hand. You need to grab your right hand and that thumb needs to be uh, squeezed because it's hurting so badly. And I'm going to yell at the top of my, my lungs. It, it's not a thought out reaction. It is an automatic thing that when something happens to one part of our body, all of our body reacts together. That's the way 
Paul is envisioning and praying that the church be, that we automatically, instantly have that empathy for one another. Romans 12, verse 15, he says virtually the same thing. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. And, and you know, at this particular time, I'm especially mindful of those who are shut in. Um, those who are uh, shut in right at this particular time is essentially all of us except those who are on the front lines and working in those uh, essential businesses and those kinds of things. Uh, the rest of us are kind of shut in as well. And it makes me think of those who, even before this occurred, and after this goes away, will still be separated from us physically because they're shut in because of illnesses. I, I'm going to pledge to you at this point in time that when this is over with, I'm going to be more mindful of talking to, visiting with, calling, trying to encourage those who are shut in. I feel more um, kin to them now at this point in time that we're shut in as well. And I ask you to pledge to do the same thing. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Every member needs compassion. Compassion is what fuels our prayers. Compassion is what fuels our service. It, it fuels our outreach. We all need that. A couple of final thoughts, not particularly uh, present in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but present in other places concerning the image or the metaphor of the uh, church as the body. One is the body separated from the head is dead. Might even call that an axiom. A body separated from the head is dead. In Ephesians, the first chapter, fourth chapter, the fifth chapter, all three places, Christ as the head of the church is emphasized by the Apostle Paul. We have got to focus on Christ as our head. He is the head of the church. And the other final thought that I had is the body is an organism, not an organization. It is not uh, the Lions Club. It's not the Rotary Club. It's not an organization. It's not a pep club. It's not the Booster Club. It's not the PTA. It is an organism an organism designed by God, bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ to be a living, caring, loving, cooperating, connected, compassionate organism depending on and serving Jesus Christ as its head. I'm honored to be a part of the 12th Street body. And these difficult times have impressed on me how much I need every one of you. God bless you. Have a good day. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for another Lord's Day that allows us to once again remember our Savior's uh, arising from the dead. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to become joint heirs with him. And we also look forward to that day when we can join him in heaven. At this time, we ask you to watch over those of our congregation who are suffering from uh, sickness, sadness, and loneliness. We also ask you to bless our caregivers and those that guard our everyday safety. We ask your blessings on our country and our leaders during this time of crisis. If it be your will, we ask you to remove this pestilence from the earth. We acknowledge that you are the creator of all we see and know. It is our hope that we do and say everything that will glorify your name. Thank you again for sacrificing your only son, and it is through him we pray. Amen.